Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about Science Hack Day and talking about hacking robots with the winners of the best science hack from the Science Hack Day weekend. That's coming up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, episode number 80, recorded on January 20th, 2011. Hacking Science and Robots. This episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour is brought to you by MailRoute.com. Businesses of every size use MailRoute, from one employee to 50,000. It doesn't matter. MailRoute will protect you from spam and viruses, simplify your life, and make your email usable again. Go to MailRoute.info for information. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. I do believe this is episode number 80. We're moving right along in the episode counts. And today is, as usual, going to be a lot of fun. It's a special day. We have more than one person not on Skype. There are six people. And if you count John and Alex, eight people, nine people in this room. We're, we're doing a big show today. We've got an outdoor camera. We've got robots waiting in the wings. Today's going to be a lot of fun. So if you're ready to get down and dirty, we're going to be talking about science hacking and robots. And why do they go together? Well, a few months ago, I guess last year sometime, there was a, a panel discussion at South by Southwest. And out of that panel discussion came the idea of a science hack day, creating a day to bring together hackers, scientists, engineers, designers, people of all sorts to hack on scientific ideas for the benefit of science. And that the idea caught caught wind and it and there was a few months later the first event the first science hack day in london and then shortly after in november of this year started by ariel waldman we had san francisco bay area's first i hope of an annual event science hack day the science hack day brought all sorts of people together. It was very exciting, and there were many, many projects that were hacked on during the weekend. Um, and today on the show, to talk about Science Hack Day and one of the winning projects, the winner of the Science Hack Project, we have Ariel Waldman, the uh, founder, or the, I guess, the, not the founder, the, the leader of the effort to get, the, uh, to get Science Hack Day uh, San Francisco started. Thank you for, for coming and joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. You're welcome. And we have NASA engineers, scientists, AI engineers. We have people of all sorts of backgrounds who came together to hack on science robots. And yep. so I will let each of them introduce themselves because we have Matt, Jeff, David, Christy, and Jade. And each of them has an interesting background, fascinating people who brought multiple uh, disciplines and ideas together to be able to put together a really successful, fascinating robotic project. So um, let's start on the on this side here. Let's see if I can get the uh, the camera side right. Um, so Matt, why don't you start us yes. off and tell us a little bit about about your background, what you do. Sure. So I'm an aerospace engineer by trade, and um, I do work at NASA, and um, I'm uh, responsible for a robotics project called Exploration Uplink, and the purpose of that project is really to bring robots and actually the opportunity to drive robots remotely into classrooms across the United States and across the world. And so um, what we do, oh, pardon me, <laughs> is that we actually have a robot that can be operated over the internet through a web browser. And so we've actually been able to demonstrate this in classrooms uh, in the United States and also in South Africa and South Korea and Canada. And so what we really want to do is make that accessible to a lot more students. So that's where we started um, in terms of uh, the idea for uh, hacking robots in science. And 
one of the needs there is to actually add more science payloads onto the robot. So it's not just uh, there with a webcam, it's actually doing some real science. And so it can, you know, the idea is that we want to be able to collect data when students are operating these robots from their classroom. And so that's what sort of fed the idea for the project that we uh, decided to do for Science Hack Day is to actually um, basically add a payload of some kind to the robot. And so it started off very broadly defined like that. And eventually uh, what we found was that there was an article in the space issue of Make Magazine that actually talked about a spectrometer that you could build yourself that was... Um, you know, relatively uh, good fidelity. And so we saw that as a, a great first instrument to try out. And so we decided to build one. And that's what you see on the table here, this thing that looks like a potato gun that was referenced <laughs> earlier. It's actually a spectrometer or a spectrograph more accurately. And so, uh, so that became the idea for the project. And so uh, that's what we brought to Science Hack Day to work on. And so really the environment of Science Hack Day um, was great because it brought together people from many different disciplines that uh, we were able to get a lot of different talents working on the project to get it off the ground quickly. And so that's really where um, where the rest of it came together from. Uh, we kind of showed up with an idea and some inspiration and um, kind of went from there. And so there's a number of different um, ro robot hacking scenes that sort of came together for this. And, um, and so, um, I, and I think many of those are represented here, so I'll let you guys kind of talk about those at more length. But um, so as, as far as that goes, that's kind of where I come from and, and sort of what my interest is in this whole thing. Excellent. Jeff? Um, all right. Uh, my name is um, Jeffrey Chu, and uh, I worked for um, an, astro an astrobiologist um, named Chris McKay. He's actually sort of um, similar to Zubrin, who you've uh, interviewed previously on the show. Mm -hmm. um, I have a pretty fun job. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, it's best described uh, by saying that I take mature, off-the-shelf products that a lot of people might interpret as toys, um, uh, one of the robots uh, we have here today, for example, has a very nice RC chassis um, as its basis. Um, uh, using cell phones, um, other existing uh, 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 products, uh, and I cobble them together to create uh, data collection systems. Uh, in particular, um, uh, Chris uh, McKay is interested in studying uh, the Mojave uh, Desert and uh, collecting a bunch of data there. And what he wants is sort of a black box he can press a, he can press a button on a computer and this device will go out and collect all of the data that is present in the Mojave Desert and it'll do it you know you know scientists they want everything all that at a, at a refresh rate of you know 300 you know times a year or something right. like that and so um, yeah that's a good, pretty good description of what I do excellent David see how far you can which uh, microphone uh, can you I lean into <laughs> oh, this one actually moves that'll be easier Hi, so I'm David Burchanowski. Um, I am not a scientist by trade. I'm actually a game developer. I um, specializing in artificial intelligence and physics programming. I um, came to Science Hack Day at the request of a friend who actually does work at NASA, which mm -hmm. was how I met most of these guys. Um, I was just trolling around trying to find a project that would be interesting to do, and. Uh, Greg was sitting over there, so I went and he introduced me to all of these fine folks. And they seemed to be the people who had the, or were having at the time, the most fun. <laughs> and so I said, all right, I'll join up with these guys. I want to be with the people who Robots are always fun. have more yeah. fun. Um, I mean, they had like three different robots, and it, it wasn't super, um, like, they didn't come there with a really concrete plan of what they wanted to do, um, or so it seemed at the time. It's like, we want to do this general thing. And I mm -hmm. thought you could get a lot more interesting results out of that, especially at a hack day when things were a little more open to interpretation and um, just kind of flowing with it a bit. And so that was how I came to be on the team. Cool. Next, make sure you speak into the microphone. Get close up. Okay. I'm uh, Christy Dudley. I, um, oh, where to begin? I joined the team. I, I showed up to Science Hack Day. Um, uh, I've known... Ariel for a while and she was saying oh you should come you should come um, I'm I'm so I finally cleared my schedule and managed to make it <laughs> out there but I didn't really have a very viable project and so she said well we got this robot donated and so the first thing I did of course is 
took the robot apart. <laughs> completely apart, all the components, parts, and pieces. And then Jade came by and said, oh, you've got a robot. The robots over here that we were working with aren't quite big enough to hold the spectrograph. Can you help with that? And so I proceeded to put the robot back together and get it working and um, uh, modified it a little bit to accommodate the spectrograph and um, then um, came to David and said, here, and here's the API. So um, we got it up and running. Uh, unfortunately, the battery's dead now. It's tragic. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I, I came, um, I've been involved in hacking robots and hacking space and hacking a number of other things. But really, that's kind of the focus that I like to look at. Um, I was involved with um, the Orb Swarm uh, art, a robotic art project, and I've mm -hmm. been involved with robo games here and there. And um, I was also, before, or when it first started out, involved with the uh, Noise Bridge, Space Bridge project, mm -hmm. that it got a uh, little coverage and wired and um, uh, a picture in that Make Magazine mm -hmm. issue that <laughs> from our first launch. So mm -hmm. that was pretty exciting. Um, that kind of petered out, and um, I wound up getting involved in uh, Team Frednet, um, and so I'm now the communication systems lead for the uh, Google Lunar X Prize team, uh, Frednet. So um, I'm really excited, and it's a lot of work, but a lot of fun too. So. Yeah, and the payoff could be so interesting. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't neat. pay any money because it's all volunteer, but it does, um, the, the payoff is great for everyone because what we wind up with is all open source yep. and everybody can use our parts and pieces and tools and things afterwards. So. Open source on the moon, I love it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> open source for the moon. For the moon, okay. Even better. Good, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Uh, hi, my name is Jade, uh, Jade Wong, and I am a neuroscientist at NASA. And um, what else? Uh, a lot of what we do in neuroscience, especially with the EEG signals, is signal processing. And Matt started talking to me about this project, and I thought, great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you jumped on in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> how does, how, how as, an, as a neuroscientist, how do you... Um, you know, get involved in a robotics project? Um, actually, I showed up at Science Hack Day not really knowing what project I was going to work on, and and I know Matt from work, so, um, and so he started telling me about his project, and, and I realized that there were a lot of uh, signal processing similarities between that and mm -hmm. things that I usually do, and so it's fairly easy to translate concepts from one thing to another. Yeah, I think I find that fascinating being able to go mm -hmm. from one discipline to another and have have the transfer of information mm -hmm. uh, actually work. Yeah, that's really neat. All right, Ariel. Yes. So we're back to you. We're around the room. People have introduced themselves. So can you talk a little bit generally about Science Hack Day? So um, why did you say, I, I need to do this. I need to get a team of people together. We need to make this happen. Um, and then how did it evolve and how did it all turn out? Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a number of things. It was kind of a, a ongoing effort really. Um, as you mentioned, there was a panel discussion at South by Southwest called Open Science. Um, a lot of that was about getting um, how people can actively contribute to science and space exploration, um, even if they don't have a formal science background. Um, and that's what uh, inspired Jeremy Keith in London to create a science hack day um, and, and, and try it out there. Um, and the more I was thinking about it, the more I was really motivated to bring one to the Bay Area uh, because both uh, we, in Silicon Valley, we have the science and technology industries here um, and they're really in awe of each other. They really get excited about each other. Like if you take a group of NASA scientists and give them a tour of Google, they get really excited. Oh my God, I'm at Google. And equally, <laughs> Googlers will be like, oh my God, there's NASA scientists here. Right. They have like so much of that awe of each other, yet there's not much social overlapping. Um, there's, uh, you'd be surprised. Like a lot of people tend to stick into their own industry and there's not a lot of cross collaboration. There's um, just socially, there's not a lot of um, intertwining. 
Um, so that was really a huge motivation that was pushing me to organize Science Hack Day in the Bay Area because, um, you know, the spirit of it is really about bringing people in the science and technology and, and just uh, miscellaneous industries and bringing them together that, so that they can connect and collaborate on um, new ideas and, and see what they can create in 24 hours. And so part of the part of the 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 way that a hack day works, it's not it's a 24 hour period. I mean, I think of it as a weekend because it went on. It was from early Saturday until late Sunday. Mm -hmm. But but the the time frame is you have 24 hours to to start your project, to work on it and finish it. And then it gets judged and judged by a jury of your peers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's really, it, it happens over a weekend, but essentially people are given 24 hours to see what they can make. Um, and really it's about ideas. Uh, hacks are really known for being, you know, you're not expected to have some polished thing that you can show off like, oh, I got all this done in just 24 hours. Mm -hmm. It's really about um, having an idea and prototyping it to a point that you can communicate what the big idea is. Um, and Hack Days are really great, and, and Science Hack Day in particular, it was really about creating a spark that uh, might later grow into a larger project or inspire people to do things in different ways um, or, or uh, you know, just think about the world in a different way. And there were a lot of hacks that really explored that. Um, one of the hacks that uh, also comes to mind is the um, uh, particle wind chime where people took uh, was part, uh, particle accelerator data and they mapped it across sound. So instead of seeing a visualization of what a particle um, a particle collision looks like, they actually heard what it sounded like. Um, and so things like that are really cool because they're things that, you know, you're in a very safe zone to sort of experiment with things and try them out. Um, and they may actually grow into larger, uh, more uh, important things. In this case, um, doing a hack like that might actually be something where it's a good um, diagnostic tool for accelerator laboratories so that they can hear, you know, if something sounds wrong or not. Mm -hmm. So from the, uh, from, from the hack day, how many, how, how was the, the turnout? How did it, how did it feel the entire event and, and uh, all of the projects at the end, like judging them and figuring out who was going to win for say best science hack or what other prizes were there as well? Uh, the event went overwhelmingly awesome. I, I, I can't even, it went better than I could have ever planned it. Um, it we had about 100 people or so that uh, came and uh, that felt like actually a, a pretty good amount um, of people because it was you know large enough that we were able to let a lot of people attend, um, but not so large that you lost sort of intimate interaction with people. Um, and people were able to sort of uh, group off into separate teams on their own and um, everyone just got along great. And, and so with all the projects, it was actually, <laughs> I felt bad with judging because hack days inherently have judging parts to them, but mm -hmm. all of the hacks were really awesome. And so, um, you know, it's really hard to decide on who's the best of something because they're, the, I mean, I, I know it's a cop out to say, but they were all <laughs> really inspiring and awesome. And um, so, it, it, to me, it was less about, um, you know, who won over who, but uh, seeing all the demos at the end, that was like really great. Um, and uh, that's definitely a part of Hack Days that is the best part because you see all everyone's work, you get to see how passionate they are about it. Um, and then you might walk away with some ideas for what you can uh, do next time or for a future project you might have. Were you inspired at the at the end of it? Did you did you have new ideas come out of it yourself, or were you uh, were there also different people that you potentially wanted? To, you're, you're like, I, I I just met this person I haven't met before, and wow, I want to collaborate with them on on some new idea. Yeah, I I met a lot of people that were just really exciting. There was a, a man who was uh, who had worked for decades in artificial intelligence and. Um, you know, it was really interesting just to have a conversation with him. Um, so a lot of it, you know, the work was inspiring, but also the conversations that you have with people are also inspiring. Um, and, and I was just so overwhelmed by the end of it, um, you know, and I've uh, kept up with a few of the people who participated at the Hack Day and some of them have actually started collaborating with one, of, one another and they had met at the Hack Day um, and other people are inspired to do similar events. I know there's been a lot of talk around doing 
uh, you know, science and art event or a science and communications mm -hmm. event. And um, I think that's great because you just start getting people who are inspired to um, have different types of communities collaborate together. And I think that's really powerful. Uh, in terms of the, 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 the prizes and, and what was actually judged there, um, we have the science hack who we're representing, whether we're representing today, but what other, what other hacks were there? And um, do you think that there was overall a really uh, great interaction between people who had no science background, like the designers mm -hmm. and um, scientists, engineers, people, you know, the, the makers and the, and the creative types that mm -hmm. allowed these, uh, these projects to become, to, to be so successful? Uh, again, I was totally, uh, in awe because I, I think there was great collaboration going and, and from different uh, sides. Uh, so there were definitely teams where someone had some design skills and someone else uh, had, you know, scientific data set and they were collaborating together that way and actually on one team and working together. Um, and so that was great. But there were also teams, I think there was a couple of uh, biotech scientists who decided to learn Arduino over the weekend. Just, right. you know, and, and they had a support system of people who were there to help them learn it. Um, so that was a case where, you know, they weren't on a team that was collaborating, but they were in an environment where everyone was really happy to offer um, help and, and, and uh, training and different things. So they were able to learn Arduino in like one weekend, which was really impressive. Um, so it, it was great. I love stuff like that. This whole, I, I was there with as video support you know that i still have to process all that video that i took from the weekend we'll give you time we'll give you time <laughs> i bit off a pretty big project there i was like i can do it oh wait <laughs> <laughs> got a lot going on but it I, I i was absolutely inspired by everything that that people were doing the one of the projects that um stuck with me was i um it was like a a location-based uh, trivia game that was socially motivated. I think mm -hmm. Amber Case was uh, yes. was one of the people uh, pushing that project mm -hmm. forward, and I just thought it was so neat. People walking down the street could enter que enter questions about a particular location, some fact-based kind of trivia about mm -hmm. a particular location. It gets put into this map that's then a game, and if you're going on a walk, you can be tr triggered by these real-world locations and go, you look at your phone, ask the questions, and it might lead you on some new new uh, level of exploration in your environment that you haven't had before. So that was one project I thought was really neat. Yeah, that's a, a perfect example of uh, using something that already exists in the world and sort of seeing how you can apply it to science. Mm -hmm. um, Amber is a, a cyborg anthropologist and um, Geoloki is, you know, a, a geolocation service that uh, sort of quasi startup that she's created um, around geotagging things and um, and just geolocation in general. Um, but out of that came the idea of what if you applied that to science education? What if, mm -hmm. you know, you could walk around your environment and and um, learn more about everything? Um, and so that I, I find those really cool because um, often people in the technology industry are working on ideas that if they were applied to the science industry would actually be really helpful. Would you do it again? <laughs> the whole I, si the, si the science hack day. I, yeah. I I know how long it took, and I and, yes. and ha have an idea <laughs> of how much effort it took to organize. Yeah, do it again. I, I will totally do it again. Uh, events are a bit of the death of me. <laughs> like it's <laughs> extremely stressful. And and as I was planning science hack day, you know, I I uh, assembled a group of fifteen co organizers, including yourself. Um, to help organize, but even with all of that help, I, I lost sleep some nights just realizing that, you know, no matter how much you organize this thing, you can't control how well people are going to get along. You can't mm -hmm. control if there, if there's going to be, you know, someone creepy that no one wants to hang out with. You can't, <laughs> you can't, you can't control if someone's going to feel left out, you know, and those things really kept me up at night because I, I wanted to ensure that it was a good, safe, awesome environment. Um, but things went well and, and I will totally do it again. And, um, you know, I think that's just part of uh, the stress that you have to deal with when you organize these things, but it's more than worth it. It's worth every bit of stress for it. So it, it was great. On the, uh, on the side of how it went for the rest of you as participants, mm -hmm. I mean, positive experience overall? 
Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. Overwhelmingly. Yeah. And I would like to point out that the, the creepy guy, they managed to get out of there in a very short order because he didn't register. <laughs> right. We, we did have some uh, late night walk-ins that we had to deal with, but, but they weren't registered. They were just kind of off the street. <laughs> uh, so I guess, Matt, let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about the, um, about the project itself and, um, you know how what kind of effort it took mm -hmm. to get it to get it going to bring everyone together and to get this great team of people together on mm -hmm. the the day of sure. to make it happen uh so the the first thing was just kind of to throw out there you know my idea for what i thought we could work on and uh, see who was interested in and so um you know once that went onto the wiki for the event wiki then i just sort of started recruiting people and uh, figuring out, you know, what are the different um, skill sets that we need and things like that. And, um, you know, so I went in with with uh, some idea of the feasibility of, oh, I think we can get something done, you know, with the people we've got. But uh, there were some people like David that came along during the event that uh, ended up being uh, completely critical to, to getting as far as we did. So uh, you can't plan all of it. And I, I kind of like that um, approach of improvising a little bit. I think it's important to retain a little bit of that because if you get too deterministic about what you're doing, then you sort of lose a little bit of that um, flair for the, um, I, I don't know, just you lose a little bit of that hacking spirit in a certain sense if it's too well planned out. So so a controlled chaos, I guess, is sort of the maybe the, the goal of the whole thing. And so, so anyway, that was, um, you know, I... I Really, the event of Science Hack Day uh, created the environment where there were the right people there and you could find people to, to do things that maybe you didn't walk in with a ready team to do all those things. So Yeah, I kind of like the, uh, the synchronicity also of uh, you being able to, to get Christy involved, mm -hmm. you know, where she came in and didn't think that she was going to be involved in the project and all of a sudden, <laughs> hello. Absolutely, yeah. I was, I was many hours in before we realized we were on the same team. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh, we are. That's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And these are, you know, these are some of the accidents of community that happen when you get some of the right people together to do these things. So. Yeah. It's a little bit like improv theater in that way. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in, in terms of, yeah, talk a little bit about that. How, how just uh, working on your, just work, working on your feet, troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. How, how hard, how difficult was that during the weekend? Um, Actually, not very. Um, one of the great things about Science Hack Day was that when we needed expertise in a particular area, such as an obscure, very old language <laughs> to program in. Um, what, what language were you guys using? Uh, well, we used, um, uh, we were working in a couple of different things, Arduino, but mostly Java. Actually, most of the software was in Java, so. Okay. Yeah. Oh. We were borrowing some reference materials that that were in um, Pascal. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And the great thing was we could hey, just wait a second. yes, I know Pascal. Yeah. We could just stand up on, in in front of the room and ask the room whether there was someone who would be able to help us, and it, and immediately our problems were solved. As in yell. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the hardest hardest problem I had to solve was to find a Windows machine. And I know. Oh gosh, yeah. That's right. And, and, and Matt had one, but it was 64 bit. We needed a 32 bit That's right, uh, yeah. Windows operating system. And so uh, we made several rounds, and everybody was looking, and everybody was volunteering. So we actually, I actually got reported to me an exact census of everybody's laptop there. Every single person, you know, I have a, a Mac, or uh, the vast majority of them were Macs. So. <laughs> <laughs> so the majority of, say, Silicon Valley um, or Bay Area hacker types, scientist hacker types, are Mac users. I will, I would, different would flavors, of <laughs> Linux. Linux, different Linux different users, flavors of Linux. Linux. Linux users. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. Macs. It's the Linux being able to use Linux on Mac. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. All kind of. the above, really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jeffrey, you're like. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it would have been grossly inaccurate to say that the vast majority of the technical and scientific people are Mac users. They're Linux users. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Jeffrey, why don't you tell us a little bit about the uh, the aspect of the project you were involved in? So, um, uh, it's sort of funny. Um, for my actual job, uh, I am uh, mounting a um, Raman spectrometer um, onto um, uh, a robot. Not the one that's outside, um, but uh, the larger one that was um, actually at Science Hack Day, the big uh, 
guy with a tabletop on it. Um, so, but I'm on strictly the robot um, design side of things. Uh, and so um, I came to Science Hack Day pretty sure I would tootle around with some of the um, uh, microprocessor programming. So maybe uh, we had some sensors and things that uh, ultrasonic range finder, infrared range finder, some things like that that we played around with. My intent was just to go in and um, familiarize myself with some more of the libraries that control these things, um, get in some more robot design stuff. And Matt had brought the spectrometer, and uh, we knew each other through work. Um, so it seemed like, okay, sure, it's a natural fit to collaborate on um, some of the uh, uh, design of the overall project. So. And David, uh, from the programming side of things, um how <laughs> you, you worked on the uh, on on the, the kind of software programming side of things, and uh, what yeah. were what were challenges for you over the weekend? Um, well, a lot of it was just finding out that the hardware that we were using wasn't actually capable of doing some of the things that we originally intended for it to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, sorry, <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Um, one of the, the things that was really unusual was that we were trying to uh, use Android to convert a spec, yeah. what well, was basically a spectrograph, into mm -hmm. an actual reading with numbers and things like that. And we found out after a couple hours going into it that that's physically impossible. You cannot convert a, an RGB image into wavelengths of light. It's not a, a proper physical mapping. Hmm. Um, and so we ended up going with an alternative scheme where we would basically just throw scan lines along the image and find what the brightest point was and then you would have to calibrate it against something like mercury or something like that before you started using it. Um, so that was uh, oddity number one. The second thing was that we found out that even if we did that, the Android does not give you images in a format that we could use and it didn't have enough processing power to make the conversion before it sent it to us. Got it. So we, um, and I had never done Android programming before, so we, uh, we had to download all of the Android development libraries and whatnot that evening. The programming didn't really start until about 8 p.m. that night, just because wow. before that it was documentation and getting the environment set up and all of these different things. And then at the 11th hour, we realized, oh, it's physically impossible to do anyways. <laughs> it was at this point, um, actually, that Christine came along with the robot, and I found out that she was involved with the project as well, which mm -hmm. total, like, deus ex machina moment here, where <laughs> out of the blue, here's a robot, oh, and it has CGI scripts to allow you to pull images off of the camera. And um, I said, great, let's hook it up. So with like two hours left to go until the end, we completely gutted the base station interface to the Android component and rewrote it to um, interface with the Rovio. And it worked. Um, I We had, I think, 10, five minutes to spare or something like that from... <laughs> Yeah, it was yeah. it was great. It was right down to the wire. Um, and then it turned out even after we had all of that, the uh, the CCD camera in the Rovio wasn't quite powerful enough to give us an image that was really easy to see. But um, if you shined a bright enough light at it, it would work. And if we put a lens in front of it, it would work great. So um, overall, it, it was fairly successful considering how much went wrong while we were developing. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. Were you going to say something? Oh, like I was that? just going to say. So in the end, we did get a, a proof of concept to show, you know, what we were trying to do, and and uh, you know, we did have these parallel teams chasing down different avenues, and mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, that ended up working out fairly well. So it was, but it was, yeah, there were definitely those moments where we thought it was kind of starting to look like a Kobayashi Maru, and we weren't sure what to do, and things like that. But <laughs> that kind of added to the fun, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah, there's got to be a certain amount of a certain amount of fun in the okay. Something with, went wrong. How do we fix it now? Not having everything. I mean, it is a hacking weekend. It's not the everything is perfect weekend. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> it's the, yeah. It's the how can we how can we work around things? What are the problems that we're going to run into? You don't know what you're going to run into going into it necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, if they're uh, Ariel, if they're if they're robots hadn't come together in the 11th hour if things hadn't worked out for the demos uh, do you think they, they would have still still gotten the science hack award I, yeah I, I again I, I still <laughs> I still stick to the fact that uh, hack days are all about ideas and and prototyping whatever you can to that idea um, I there were actually a, a couple of demos by people that they didn't have anything to show all they had to uh, explain was their idea. Um, and, and that's okay. And I, um, 
I tried to encourage a lot of people um, to think of different ways to prototype their ideas because a lot of times people will think, oh, I want to create some sort of scientific community where scientists and can go in um, and, you know, rate different data sets or do these things. And, and I want uh, people, just the general public, to be able to use the website. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, but I need a developer to create this website. Well, yeah, that's kind of true. But also you can spend that weekend, you know, wireframing out how would it work and and, and doing things like that. And so mm-hmm. if you don't have access to a developer or, or, or someone that you need, you can still map out in some way how it works and explain that to someone. And that might inspire someone to um, get involved at a later date or something. So it, it's really, it doesn't matter what the final output is. It's really about communicating ideas um, and, and you know, doing things that do inspire people. And in some cases, you know, that's a robot. But if the robot didn't move, I don't think, like, anyone would be like, oh, this is crap. <laughs> like, <laughs> that, that robot is stationary. I call, I call bananas. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, that robot doesn't move. <laughs> yeah, so that's really, it's really not the, the point um, because uh, the, the prizes at Science Hack Day are for the best hacks, not the best presentations. And, and so that was something that all the judges made sure to understand that, so... So let's, we're, we're going to run out of daylight here pretty soon, and we have mm. robots in the backyard. So let's talk a little bit very briefly about the robots that we have mm-hmm. here. What have you brought, and what are we going to go see outside, and what's going to be demoed? Sure. So um, I'll start and then hand it over to you, Jeff. So um, the robot that we're going to show for you is really kind of the next-gen robot that we'll be using uh, for Exploration Uplink, which is a project at NASA that's supported by the NASA Lunar Science Institute and the Spaceward Bound Program. And so it's not um, considered an operational robot yet. It's still kind of in the prototype phase, um, uh, but it is kind of the direction we're headed in in terms of open source robots and, and the next uh, next phase of things. So, All right. That. Go ahead. Um, so, so the two um, uh, robots outside that will um, demonstrate driving around, um, uh, the smaller one is uh, uh, made by a company called Robots Everywhere. Uh, it's um, owned and operated by a friend and colleague of mine who's helping me with the larger one, um, uh, uh, which is, again, uh, very similar in design to the robot that's going to carry the Raman spectrometer uh, one day. Um, uh, it's a collaborative effort from a group uh, uh, that I'm a part of called Phenomenal. Um, and, uh, yeah, the idea is um, if we lower the bar in terms of cost, in terms of how much you need to know in order to use and operate a robot and how much money you need to have in order to purchase one and operate a robot. Um, If we lower the bar of entry to scientists, a lot more science will get done. Um, And the idea is to have them doing analysis on data sets, not um, wandering around actually collecting the data sets. That Um, makes a lot of sense. Yep. And Christy. Yeah. um, uh, This is my robot here sitting on the table. Um, I haven't really done much with it since hack day i was expecting to just be able to pull it out of the box charge it up and and bring it in unfortunately um i we've had battery problems so it's not too bad (laughs) so it's our stationary robot today (laughs) but um i think i mentioned earlier i i basically gutted the rovio extended the the uh cables for um for the camera and for the antenna and some other things um, so that we could mount the the uh, spectrograph on the head of the robot um, and still operate it as a an arm so, mm-hmm. uh, the 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 rovio base that i uh, the thing that i find interesting about it is the way that the wheels are set oh, up can you tell I, me a little bit I about the holonomic because we're not going to see yeah, it move yeah. can you at least just, um, just describe the, that they're holonomic wheels that's the technical term for it uh basically wheels within wheels um the they they'll roll around do you want to hand that i i love to do you want up, me to be your uh, robot up. hand yeah, model <laughs> <laughs> yeah um ooh. <laughs> the spectrograph goes yeah. flying yeah Oh, no. Yeah, it's... (laughs) Robot malfunction. (laughs) Okay. Um, So, basically, um, we have the wheels that turn, um, that rotate 
as you'd expect, and that's the way they drive. But we also have wheels that are perpendicular to the rotation of the main wheel so that they, they'll roll sideways. And these are often referred to as the slip wheels, so that as it's driving forward, it can slip a little sideways. Um, and since, as you notice on this robot, um, all the wheels are pointed different directions. Yeah. Um, whenever it's moving in any direction, there has to be some degree of slip. And so this gives it a really tight um, ability to control, rotate, um, and, and roll in any direction. Although it's the, the cost of these is complexity because they're very um, complex to, to build and so forth. Right. So. Anyway. Yeah, but absolutely um, essential for uh, maneuverability and there. There are other ways you can try to get around it, but this is—it's the most straightforward and easy w to control way uh, to get um, a, an absolute control over the positioning of your robot. So cool. Um, and if this were if this were functioning, you could uh, move it. It would move around, um, be mobile. The spectrograph would be able to get take in light information, take in right, and, 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 and then arm. where would that information end up going again? Okay. Uh, I would also like to point out that the arm can raise and lower the spectrograph. Um, nice. We actually had it um, so that it would um, raise and lower at an angle. Um, and so basically what happens is the, the there's a camera in the back end of it um, that's picking up light. That would be the side. Right, right. Um, that's picking up light from the slit in the front. And um, it sends it to the processor, which actually has a web server on it that has the CGI scripts hmm. or the, that'll run the CGI scripts that David was talking about earlier. Um, and Rovio is kind enough to have a published API for it. <laughs> Nice. So, yeah. Excellent. So I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, to take a quick break and uh, thank our sponsor for this show. And you guys, if you want to get outside and we'll follow you with the camera and microphone, um, you can get, the, get your robot set up really fast. We'll come out for some demos in a second. <laughs> I'd like to take this opportunity to thank MailRoute.info for sponsoring this hour of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Businesses of every size use MailRoute because MailRoute is a secure hosted service that filters virus and spam for just about any way, wh anyone, whether uh, you have one user or 50,000 users really does not matter. MailRoute can eliminate viruses and spam, reduce the load on your email server, lower your costs, and make your email usable once again. Typical MailRoute customers see a 95% reduction in their inbound email volume with virtually no false positives. And for you sciencey folks out there, you know how bad false positives are, right? Anyway, don't just take my word on it here. Leo and Tom, both here at the Twit Cottage, the Twit Network, use MailRoute and have had wonderful success at making email accounts usable that were completely unaccessible, completely bound up, bricked with spam and viruses. MailRoute solved that problem, made them easy to use again. Very successful program, very successful. So there's nothing easier for mail filtering than MailRoute. There's no hardware, no software for you to install. You just sign up with mail, MailRoute and then change your MX records and uh, your domain just starts the mail flowing through them and they do all the work for you. So easy, you don't have to do the work, MailRoute does the work. Here's the deal. You visit MailRoute.info, I-N-F-O, and as a Twit listener, you're going to get a 10% discount for the life of your account. That's for the life of your account, MailRoute.info. Don't go to MailRoute.com, go to MailRoute.info because this is a special website specifically for you, Twit listeners. Small business accounts start at $2 per user per month for 10 users, and because of demand from the Twit Army, MailRoute has added a completely new service for individual users as well, less than $30 per year for single users. Yeah, come on over here. So once again, visit mailroute.info, M-A-I-L-R-O-U-T-E dot I-N-F-O, and sign up with the email filtering service that Tom and Leo use. With that, I think we're going to go head on out to the great outdoors 
and check out some robots outside. I'm ready, so I'm going to come on outside. We are uh, heading out there right now. Oh, let me, we can see them on the double screen. We have Matt on the microphone right now who's going to tell us a little bit about what's going on. Great. So what we have here is the new prototype robot that we'll be using for exploration uplink. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking um, uh, basically a laptop and a joystick uh, an operations interface into classrooms. And students are going to be able to operate the robot across the internet uh, directly from their classroom. And usually we would have the robot in a simulated lunar environment that's located um, at the NASA Research Park um, at Moffett Field. And, um, but in this case, we decided to bring it here just because that was a lot more interesting to show it actually operating for you guys. And so, um, and so, and, and right, so, um, so you can see that the, uh, uh, basically, uh, the idea is that the robot is very like open hardware and open open source software, and so you've got an Android phone on the top. That's actually uh, the camera is what you use to drive the robot, and so uh, from the laptop, uh, the operations interface, you can actually see the the video feed coming in from the web from the uh, the camera of the phone, and um, and down below is basically the chassis of an RC car, which has been modified to be controlled. Um, by a microcontroller, and so uh, most of the software, I think all of the software actually is is open source that that runs this thing, and so there's really two pieces of it that we we want the students to sort of learn about. Uh, one is that we want them to know that they too can build robots and they too can build open source robots and and do interesting things like this because look at it, it's just a cell phone and an RC car. They probably have that at home already, right? Um, and so uh, that, and then the other thing that we show them is uh, in the simulated lunar environment uh, back at NASA, we actually have, uh, we send them on two mock missions. Uh, one is that they uh, do a, essentially a meteorite hunt. So they have rocks that are um, located in the simulated lunar environment and then one meteorite, and it's a, a metallic meteorite. So it looks decidedly different from the rocks. And so their job is to go in and find the meteorite. And then the second thing they do is they're required, not required, but they're encouraged to um, to uh, essentially photograph a crater. And so they have to navigate the, the robot, robot to a crater and record an image of it. And, um, and so that actually can be relatively difficult. One of the things we talked to them about is the uh, difference between communicating with a robot that's right in front of you and one that's on another planet. So if you have a robot that's on the moon, there's about a 1.2 second delay uh, just sending a radio signal from the Earth to the moon. And so for a round trip, you have to double that. Well, when you're driving something with a joystick, that means you've got a lot of lag. And so it's not like playing an FPS game where there's, you know, milliseconds of lag, there's like multiple seconds of lag. And so, so it requires a very different driving style to be able to do that. So just being able to drive up to a meteorite and take a picture of it ends up being fairly challenging in that environment. And so they learn a little bit about how uh, the moon is actually very far away from the earth in that case. And so uh, it ends up being really interesting. The students get a kick out of it. Uh, you know, when they crash into something, everyone laughs and they're having a good time. And so uh, it's really fun because we have the, the fun side of things kind of covered and then we're able to bring some education into the picture and, and teach them a bit about space exploration and, and robots. So in the process, do you, uh, do you write into the program the lag time of the driving so that the, so that the students would get, really get that feeling of driving it? It's all written in. Yeah, so um, there's really two ways to do it. One is if we're actually uh, linking uh, with a classroom that's on another continent, then the delay ends up being about right anyway, and we don't change anything. And then uh, our network is able to uh, factor in a delay if we want more. So, so we do it actually. So if you want like a Mars, Mars type delay. Absolutely. Well, that would be a whole other thing. Um, yeah, we're, we're not really... <laughs> yeah. 20 minutes later. Yeah. That usually is hard to do in, in one day in a classroom <laughs> that way. Yeah. <laughs> it would be interesting, though. We should, maybe we can make a weekend event out of it. That can be the next uh, Mars hack day or something. <laughs> Driving rovers on Mars, kind of. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah. Jeffrey. Yeah. of um, the robot. So, um, as Matt said uh, uh, previously, it's got an RC car chassis, um, which is very nice. Uh, we went about uh, trying to make a data collection system, not to redesign an RC car chassis. Uh, the other thing we did is we threw a phone on it. One thing that's really cool about um, using a phone to replace a computer when you're making an inexpensive robot system is um, it's already been made small, it's already been made tough, it's already been made to avoid um, using a lot of electricity. It's taking advantage
advantage of this bizarre phenomenon where some company who um, makes its money some other way by providing um, service as opposed to you know uh, making you pay through the nose for hardware has really 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 thoroughly developed something and you can take advantage of that in a hacker like way and uh, use it for something very useful that it was uh, not its original intended purpose and so it's another uh, I think salient feature about the robot and cell phones happen to have lots of sensors on board too which you can do some fun stuff with you're saying GPS accelerometers, yeah. Oh, and cameras especially. <laughs> yeah, you you said uh, that at the the weekend itself, you had issues with the phone that you put on that you weren't able to get it. Um, so um, uh, apparently, with the Android, uh, not with the Android operating system, with the cameras, they're um, uh, pulling in an RGB feed, and in order to do spectrometry, um, like this is um, actually his field. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but in order to be doing accurate spectrometry, um, you didn't need uh, you needed something other than um, uh, RGB values. Yeah. So the problem that you have with uh, spectrometry, uh, blast, spectrometry, and I didn't know anything um, about this before the Hack Day weekend. It was kind of like part of the fun of it was learning all of this about spectrometry. Was that um, there really isn't a mapping between RGB values because like what do you map gray to or white to? They don't have an equivalent, and so. Our original plan was just to go through and like sum up all of the different color values that we were getting from the robot and we could you know average this out and say well we have so much of this particular wavelength in the light source um, we'll add that up but you can't do that for that reason of what do you map gray to what do you map teal to it doesn't have a color there was that delay. yeah um, but what, what you can do, however, is uh, by calibrating the image, still get the uh, like a spatial locality method where you just have the the stripes as a strip and you sample it across the the spectrum. Um, and then once the camera is calibrated, you can build an image from that instead, and that does work. Um, just to add to that, um, the way that a spectrometer works, it the, the diffraction grading actually gives you a um, uh, the diffraction grating has a slit of uh, of white light, and then because of the way that the wavelengths differ, it the light is bent differently. So you get a spread of colors, um, and the spread of colors are actually aligned um, due to their wavelength. I was just going to add that none of us had ever actually made an Android app before we started <laughs> that weekend, so that was kind of another thing that came into the picture with that. I think that the I think looking at this whole thing, how everything's been put together, basically found parts. You know, the 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 design itself seems to work really well, um, and as well with your with with the FredNet robot as well, the Rovio with the the Spectrum. That's not the that's not the FredNet robot. Oh, um, the I actually I brought uh, the FredNet robot, but it's not much to look at, and it doesn't have a brain right now. So <laughs> every robot needs a brain <laughs> to be really worth working. But the um, I'm just thinking the the co this bring the cost is down. It makes it really accessible, so that and also using open source using the Android platform. Um, it just seems to me that this is the kind of thing that could be so inviting to so many students, non-students, just hackers, anybody who's interested in trying to figure out how to develop their own robotic system. Absolutely. I uh, recently was brought to my attention that someone had made a robotic snowplow for their driveway. And so it occurred to me that, holy cow, um, you know, there's people that make um, they basically have a business, um, you know, shoveling driveways and things like that. Well, all of a sudden, if you can have a robot doing that, you've got like a cottage industry that's almost kind of coming up around these easy to prototype robot systems. All with the power of a cell phone. No. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Even better. He can like drive it down the street from home using the cell phone and not have to go to the driveways to, to clear them out or something. That would be, how much fun would that be? <laughs> If I lived in a snowy place, maybe a lot of fun. <laughs> Could be good. Um, so we are getting, we're starting to lose our light out here, but um, is there anything that anybody wants to add that hasn't really been said about the project so far that, um, you know, where it's going to go from here, what you started, where you're going to take it, what you hope, is this going to, where, do you hope it to go someplace else, bigger? Do you all hope to be involved in this project or pass it on to other people? 
Well, I think, um, you know, where we want to go is we want to make it so easy to do stuff like this that, you know, almost any classroom can do it and it lowers the barrier to entry to do, um, you know, interesting projects like this and uh, that we make it easy for them to build uh, science platforms so that, um, you know, almost any student anywhere can build a robot and take it out into an environment around their school and, and do science. And they can actually uh, have, you know, a scenario where students from another school will operate the robot in their backyard and, and kind of swap or something like that. So there's things like that that it would be really great to do. And also, just based on the nature of the event itself, these um, these projects have a tendency to emerge out of chaos. And um, and very much like this, uh, actually, and I heard about it from Matt too, there is going to be an art hack day. Um, similar population and uh, hacking on art, or making art, really. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we'll bring the scientists and the engineers into the art world and see what we can get out of that. Absolutely, yeah. That sounds like a lot of fun. Well, um, I I really like the idea of um, that uh, Matt was saying with uh, really focusing on promoting, putting um, things off the shelf together. But I I like to extend his his invitation to beyond just students, and I think everybody should be involved um, on a personal level in thinking about how you can put interesting off the shelf parts together and and make uh, uh, cool robots and toys and and things that do extra stuff yeah not necessarily going out and needing to buy a, a Lego Mindstorms kit but what can you actually put together yourself right um, when I was a kid um, my parents never bought us you know the package toys and so we had to figure out how we were going to make these cool things that they showed on television without them and I thought that was a tremendous exercise in in you know building your own world and not having to buy what you're sold um, because it, it, it also um, as an individual I'm, I'm very serious about hacking <laughs> Um, but as an individual, it, it helps you explore and control your own world. So, a lot, a lot, a lot, lot to do with science there as well. Yeah, exploring your world. So um, um, I'm a big believer of the um, lowering the barrier to entry thing. Um, in addition to that, um, I caught, come across this issue of uh, nobody's made some of the toys I'd like to play with. Um, and so, uh, for the foreseeable future, I, you know, uh, uh, as a friend of mine says, the future won't invent itself. And so you have to take personal responsibility for making the toys you'd like to play with. More robots. How do you control the robot? You um, so um, I'd say go ahead and take a seat. Um, take a seat. Yeah, you'll be more comfortable that way. Um, so uh, this is not the ground station controller that I initially intended on using today. You mean um, a laptop? Uh, well, so um, uh, 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 I had one that has a, um, a numerical pad, um, and so um, uh, it's not set up for wads um, if you're a first-person uh, shooter player. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, well, can you enable keyboard mode on the, the side panel there? Over here? Yeah. No, no. Uh, no well, no, so there's here. other... Oh, maybe. We won't get into that at the moment, though. Okay. That was a good idea, though. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, I've got... Um, this is a uh, more generic um, interface uh, than uh, is applicable to either one of these robots uh, because that one, for example, has three servo motors. It's got a steering servo motor, a pan servo motor, and a tilt ser servo motor, but the microcontroller design um, has room for six. And so there's a, uh, a bunch of UI stuff on here that's not going to be used or make a lot, a lot of sense necessarily. It's set up so that um, uh, you have to repeatedly flutter forward or turn commands. It's natural resting state. Let's say if you lose control is to come to a stop. It's always at halt and you need to um, spam it with move around commands in order to get it to move it around. Um, you got a pan and a tilt. Right now these are controlled by slider bars. Like I can pan the, um, uh, the camera around uh, like this. Neutral is about 102 which is a calibration thing. Uh, we're getting a reading off the magnetic compass, which is kind of cool. It's one of those um, sensors that's built into the phone. And we're getting use out of that. Um, it's actually, um, uh, if we were online, I could show like an overlay of like a Google map and where this phone thought it was within its GPS units degree of accuracy. So like, you know, within three meters or something like that. And so it's not, in a lot of ways, the phones, that phone uh, isn't exactly good enough for um, 
uh, scientific data collection, but it's a great pl prototyping platform, and these things are just getting better. Um, my phone uh, is a significant improvement over that phone. Um, uh, uh, this this guy right here. Uh, it's a it's a it's an it's an HTC um, um, Evo. Evo? Or, yeah, exactly. So it's got it's got a real serious processor on it, yeah. um, uh, and that's they're not going to get worse. They're going to get better. Um, and so I'm developing all this stuff. Um, oh, and they're stacking up in people's drawers too. Um, I, I, when I those old phones. When I when I started doing um, the cell phone robot idea, um, I had like eight different friends come to me with two phones a piece kind of a thing. Here's a bunch of G1s. Here's I've I've upgraded. I've upgraded, and they had like a couple of these things, and they're really robust computers that are a, you know some sort of a hazard if they're not dealt with properly. They could be really cool toys. Um, so that was. Um, Another thing that got me really excited about um, uh, turning Android phones into all sorts of stuff, actually, because they are really inexpensive, um, pretty complete, robust computer systems. Um, yeah, 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 they absolutely are. They yeah. can do so much these days. Um, and they're and they're being um, they're uh, they're they're not being sold for their true value again because uh, there's an economy built around them uh, that is not making its money that way. Very interesting. I love it. This is fascinating. This has been so much fun. I can't believe you guys all came out here to Petaluma. I love that you brought your robots and we got a chance to take a look at them. I'm sorry that the light is fading and that we are so far into the end of the day, but thank you all so much. Do appreciate your time. And I know that the audience as well has probably been just fascinated in this topic. And I hope that everyone here has gotten you inspired to get involved in science hacking and exploring your environment, maybe finding some off-the-shelf uh, components that you can build into your own robot. And maybe we'll see you at this year's Science Hack Day, which will be happening again, right, Ariel? <laughs> Says it is correct. So <laughs> thank you very much for watching. This has been Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Next week, we're going to be talking about bad science with Ben Goldacre, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. In the meantime, you can catch past episodes at twit.tv forward slash kiki, K-I-K-I, and you can find me online, Dr. Kiki. Everybody, uh, I'm going to run through the list. Let me know. Tell me what, where people can find you. Ariel. Uh, people can find me at arielwaldman.com, uh, but spacehack.org is the directory of ways to participate in space exploration and find different ways that you can start hacking. Great. Jeffrey. Well, I can be found at uh, g.offchu at gmail.com. I am uh, longoboard, L-O-N-G-O-B-O-R-D on Twitter and at gmail.com. You can uh, find me at awesomenessinabox.com, and there's a uh, form to send me a message on there. Uh, you can find me at jadism.com and uh, Twitter name QIQING. You can find me on Twitter at Matt808, M-A-T-T-808. Great. Thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Have a great week. We'll be back next time.